Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Creating Structure Podcast. I'm John Wheaton, your host. Great to have you back. My esteemed guest today, Kevin Carey, mountain mover, construction entrepreneur, coach, speaker. Kevin, welcome to the show. Man, I'm excited, John. It's an honor to be here. You're a celebrity out there when it comes to the glazing and facade world. And I, I did a, I took a peek at some of your episodes and man, that opening music had, had me bump into it. I like the intro. It was pretty good, man. Thanks for that. Shout out to Joshua Wheaton, my son, who actually made, produced, recorded that beat from scratch. That's his original work. I said, make me a beat, man. Make me a lead in and an outro. And he did it. Oh, shout out to Josh. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Thanks for that, Kevin. It's great to have you. So you got a lot to share. I think you've got a lot to offer the audience. Um, you've been in the glass and glazing industry. You've been in construction industry. Now you're, you're on to a new chapter. Just to introduce yourself again, tell us who you are, where you're from, a bit about your background so we can get into this discussion. Yeah, I'll live a, for a second in, in the now. I'm uh, a proud Christian. Uh, I, uh, I'm married to my wife, Sadie, for six years. We have a five-year-old daughter, Quinn, who is my princess. We live in the Fort Worth region, so about 20 minutes south of Fort Worth. Going to the come-up story, I grew up on the south side of Chicago a blue collar family. My dad was a union caulker and still is a union caulker to this day. And my mom was a baker and a bus driver. And, uh, I feel like I, it, growing up, I got a combination of both of them. You know, my dad's a, my dad's a, you know, tough, hard worker, very strong work ethic, but how he treated a stranger, uh, was really admirable for from the parking lot attendant to the grocery store clerk. It didn't matter. I always got to see these interactions growing up, which really helped shape my character later in life. And then my mom's the one with the heart on her sleeve. She's the one, she's the gentle one, the lover and uh, very kind. And so I had kind of that combination of both put in me as, as I grew older. And it's always cool to look back at that and, and just know, man, that, that upbringing really shapes you. That's awesome. Um, we share a common faith journey then. So that's awesome to know. Um, and uh, we're all just figuring out as we go, right? 100%. I, I got to stop and say, wait a minute, where on the south side of Chicago? I was born in Berwyn, Illinois, which okay, the Chicago. Um, my dad went to IIT. So he was a big White Sox fan. He grew up in Hinsdale, which is not on the south side of Chicago, but was a small little farm town back when he grew up. So we're on the south side. So that's what you do. Once you, you say Chicago, and then once you meet somebody that's been there too, it's time to drill down. Exactly. So, yep. So we did Burbank, Oak Lawn, and then Orland Park. So those were the okay. three cities that I lived in. So we kept moving further away from Chicago proper yeah. as I got older. And so I spent 25 years out there, went to, wow. I lived in Orland Park, but I, I was on the border of Lockport and Sandburg High School, if you're familiar with that. So I went to Lockport High School. Um, going to school, I, I mean, construction was in my blood from the very beginning. And I figured I was either going to the trades, the union trades, or the military. Those were the two options that I saw. Love and it. Uh, as a favor, I, a favor or promise, whichever one you want to count to my mom, she just wanted me to apply to a school. So I kind of looked, I remember my buddy Jake sitting at school. I'm like, Hey, what school are you applying to? And he's like, Illinois state. I'm like, cool. I'll go grab an application. <laughs> and I made the commitment. If I get into this one school I was applying to, I would, I would go to college and I love like, it. So they must've slipped up in the admissions portion and mine somehow got accepted. I'm like, huh, I guess I'm going to college. And you know, there's not this like crazy. I had, I had a destiny from the very beginning. It was kind of just found my way to that just out of a commitment to my mom. God bless the moms. And it's nice that you made that you delivered on that promise to your mama. That's a really good thing. And we might do it for a dad, but we definitely do it for a mom. That's for sure. That's right. And well, and I, honestly, selfishly, I didn't think there would be much of a chance that I actually got in. 
you know, I, I was definitely a Dennis the Menace growing up, but I could keep decent grades. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't think of myself as like a, a white collar guy, to be honest. I, yeah. I, I admired the trades. I swung a hammer ever since I was a little kid. My dad would be working on something and just to keep me involved or hold the flashlight, as they say, he would just cut off a two by four and, and give me a hammer and nails. And I would just hammer these nails into the boards. I love and, it. Uh, and, I, and I just loved it from the beginning. And my friends that were older than me when I was in high school, they're making really good money in the trades after their four-year apprenticeship. I'm like, this sounds awesome. And amongst the, the, the timeline of me going through school, 9-11 happened. So, oh, wow. so I was on fire to, you know, to go fight for our country. So the, without going into too much detail how that fell, I ended up at the end of the day going to college due to getting into the one I applied to. And where is Illinois State? Bloomington Normal. It's a few hours south of Chicago. How far from like Champaign, Urbana? Like how far from? I, I know that answer because my girlfriend at the time was went to U of I. It's between 45 minutes to an hour. Okay. Interesting. You know, we've got, we've got Kent State and Univer Kent State University and University of Akron 20, 30 minutes apart here, um, different highways. Then you've got Ohio University in Athens and you've got the Ohio State University in Columbus. <laughs> and they're not a half an hour, an hour apart. They're further apart, but still similar. So that's great. So thanks for that background. So, gee, I'm guessing you're going to say somehow your your initial entry into glass and glazing had something to do with your father being a union caulker. You wouldn't say. Uh, yeah. I, I came out of school in 07 and yeah. uh, there, there just wasn't that much work out there. And I, I was really lost when I graduated. I had no idea what I was going to do. I had a business management slash entrepreneurship degree, which is very vague, you know, wow. You can't go very specific into what you're going to do. You learned a vast, a vast curriculum, so it's not like very specified. And it's a rat race to find that first job. You know, we, we fight this corporately where you're asking people for entry-level pay and positions, but you want two to four years experience. And it's like, I don't have this. And, and so just trying to find a job was really difficult. And so since you're a Midwestern guy too, you might be familiar with Menards. I came out, came out of college and the first one that took me was Menard's management program. Wow. And, and so I, I had a six month timeline before my college debt, I had to start paying off. Like you have a six month grace period after graduating, whatever job I could get, I could, I took. And it, in the moment, you know, I was making, I was making 14 an hour, whatever the case may be, low 20,000 per year. And I'm like, it, I, a four-year degree got me here. A four-year apprenticeship could have been drastically different uh, yeah. in the trades. And, and in the moment, it's really hard to see what a future can look like. But, you know, you just you, you just keep grinding in the moment. And uh, my dad was caulking for a few glazing outfits in Chicago, and he just was would pass my information along as they went. And he got me an interview at a small glazing outfit in Chicago and uh, I interviewed and took the job and it was one of those lateral moves, but kind of, all right, at least I'm out of Menards. I'm, I'm into back into construction and my love. And then the, the race was on and glazing. And was that D and M architectural? Yes. Yes. Yes, it was. Got you. And then, um, and I know you've moved to a new step in your career, but you know, we have construct, our audience has tradespeople, constructors, architects, entrepreneurs, glass and glazing people, exterior facade people, all of them. So it's interesting to just talk a little bit about the background and your path forward. So you grew up in Chicago, Chicago area, kept moving, moving further south. Same with my relatives. Like they started, you know, moving out now. Now they're out in Manhattan and Joliet and Wheaton and all, you know, we've been in Ohio for years. Yeah. That seems to be the trend. Um, so you were at d &M for a while, and then how'd you get to AGT? Great question. So uh, I was working out at a gym, and I would see Brian Flipiak there. And uh, I knew that my dad was um, doing work with them, too, and, and talked them up. And 
uh, I just became friends with Brian, you know, and we'd, cr- we'd crack jokes, we'd spot each other. Uh, he was, he was a younger guy and I was like, man, this dude's a young guy and he's a leader and he's leading a company. And that's, that's pretty awesome. And so I just, I, he's got this, like, he's got this charm and charisma to him where like, you're just naturally drawn. And so him and I started hanging out and, uh, I remember him giving me a smirk and he's like, dude, if I keep seeing you here, I'm, I'm going to have to hire you someday. And, uh, <laughs> I just remember one day, uh, looking down at my phone and, uh, there was a text message there and he said, Hey, check your email. And I had an offer letter in there from him. And, uh, and so I, I jumped at the opportunity. That is a great story. It all, you just never know the path. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So you were there for a while. Any, any, any learning lessons, any, you know, experiences there that, you know, kept that moved you closer to where you are now, or how did that experience work for you? What did you learn? I, I learned a tremendous amount. Um, you know, I'll, I'll always credit Brian for giving me so many chances, despite my age, it didn't matter. And he told me that the first day I started with that company that I, I don't care about how long you've been here. Like if you're half as good as I think you are, you will move up and you will get opportunity. And at that moment in my life and career, I was very focused on me, right? I, I was selfish and I, I was grinding for me. I didn't have a purpose yet. And if my purpose was defined, it was probably either title or money, you know, mm-hmm. which fast forward today, it's completely 180, but that not at that time. So, you know, I leaned into that opportunity and I, and I hustle hard and it, you know, back then it was sink or swim mentality. You're going to get a lot on your plate. Can you, can you navigate the waters? Sometimes you move up in position because somebody gets moved out, Yeah, but he, but he always gave me those opportunities. And, um, I'm a, after flying the nest, as I call it, I, he gave me an opportunity to move from Chicago to Dallas when they were opening their Dallas operations. And at that time, so this was May of 2010, I was single, no kids at the time unsaved. I should add, add as well, because I didn't understand that was part of this equation at the time. But I was single, no kids. I was like, I don't know anything about Dallas, but this just seems like a a way to catapult my career. Let's go. And so when I moved to Dallas, I assumed I would see tumbleweeds and and horses. (laughs) And and I get here, I'm like, this is just a smaller Chicago. This is is the exact same. And uh, I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hustle of not knowing anybody. I I thought it was a reset. I thought it was an opportunity to re-identify myself as a person and... I just leaned into it. I'm going to make a joke and everybody's probably going to get angry at me, but bring it. You were thinking of Fort Worth, not Dallas. 100%. Sorry. Whoever's. Yeah. I don't, I'm just joking. Um, the Texas but it people is a love little that. more ranchy. It is a little more ranchy than Dallas, let's say. 100%. But that's again, another great story. So you eventually worked yourself up to director of pre-construction um in business development did you find more of a niche in like do you feel like you're more more as with your entrepreneurial management like education although you didn't even know what that meant at the time probably yeah. did you find yourself like more aligned with the skills and competencies like did that give you energy like were you more aligned with business development and sales or do you feel that that's just a natural progression for somebody who starts to learn the nuts and bolts of their their profession Oh, that's a great question. Um, a little bit of both. I would I would lean towards the the first that like it started uncovering some ta- some talents in me that I didn't understand I had, mm-hmm. which is a lot of things that I've learned in reflection. Like what got me here, and it's those it, it's fundamentals. It's I'm not a wizard at glazing, but I, I'm going to work really hard to learn or surround myself with people that will. And again, a Brian thing when he wanted to switch me from project management to business development, I'm like, Oh, I hate salespeople. Like it, I'm I, I think I'm, <laughs> like, is this a demotion? I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm really good project manager. Like what, why would we do this? And he's, and he looked at me, he's like, Kev, don't, don't change a thing with who you are. You keep being who you are and sales will follow. And I didn't, I just trusted him. I didn't really like absorb that at, in the moment. Yeah, but, but he's absolutely right. And then I moved to Texas, which is an absolute relationship business. 
And uh, I think, you know, I saw that in the notes that we're going to talk a little bit about this, but I, I started that journey very transactional. Hi, John, you have something I need. I, I, I'm going to go get it. I'm going to talk to you about it. I, I don't care about your family. I'm not going to ask about it. You know, and it's just like rough. And um, what I've discovered over time is just like trying to figure out who that person is. And, and not, not for selfish reasons either. Just go build relationships. Go find friendships. This industry starving of that connection piece. And, and when you can find it, now you get to align your, your personal life with your professional life because you're doing business with friends. And, and so items like serving, so serving from a faith standpoint and from an industry standpoint, I'm heavily involved in Texo Association, which is kind of the convergence of ABC and AGC out here. Oh. And and I joined, I joined Texo huh. in 2012, I want to say. Okay. Again, selfish motivation. Like, how do I go find clients? But what I ended up doing is finding my people in Texas. Like, I, you, you start showing up to events and you start meeting, oh, this guy works for this subcontractor, this, this architect, this GC. And you keep seeing them and then you build friendships with them and um, they're Christians before I'm a Christian. They're, they're fathers before I'm a father and they're, they're husbands before I'm a husband. And I'm getting to watch how they do it. And I'm like, I didn't see that back home. Like it, man, these are good people. They're dating their daughters and showing like taking them to Chick-fil-A in a suit with flowers. And like, I'm watching all this sort of stuff. I'm like, these are great people. I just want to do life with them. Interesting. And, and, and that's the, like the natural magic of business development. When you just build those relationships with where business kind of, kind of becomes secondary. And when the business needs to be talked about, it gets, it gets talked about and it feels natural. Um, so sorry, a, a very long winded way of saying, I, no, I keep going that, that, that little bit in business development really showed that, yeah, I don't have to be what I pictured in my head to be effective at it. I just had to be myself. And, and, yeah. and there's a lot of, there's a lot of wisdom in that. Thanks for sharing that, Kevin. That's awesome. We got a bunch of, Questions and comments around that line, but first, tell the audience what Texo stands for. So, the so Texo, the, what is I, Texo? I'll just, I'll just call it the Construction Association. So it's okay. one of the largest commercial construction associations in the United States, and it converges ABC and AGC chapters together in North Texas. So That's, if you're a member of Texo, you're both an ABC member and an AGC member. Okay, got you. So the Construction Association, that's that's great. We'll talk about your role now on that in a minute, which is pretty sure. significant. But yeah, it is a relationship business. And um, I don't know that I agree with this statement, but I, I've been thinking about it a lot. I heard somebody say the other day, many of you have been Gary Vee saying, sales is just poor marketing. Sales is lazy business development and lazy marketing. Like if you have to work at the sale... I don't really subscribe to that completely, but I know what they're saying. Like, it's always about the other. It's always about the client. It's always about the person. And it's not about the sale. It's about what, who are you? What are your needs? What value gaps? What pain are you experiencing? What does your enterprise lack? Is there anything I can do to help and deliver to that, to design and monetize in such a way that you will feel a manifold benefit? It is not about us. It's not about our message. It's about the client, right? 100%. I'm going to subscribe way more to what you just said than, than that, that Gary V thing, for sure. Like fortune favors the prepared. You, it, when you have a project interview go, going in, if you think relationship only is going to get you there, that's what's going to get you beat by somebody that's hustling and prepared and has yeah. assembled their team together and says, hey, when this question's asked, who's answering it and how are you answering it? Yeah. I remember we had a big interview a few years ago and we did, we did like a half day of preparation. And rather than doing introductions, you know how usually, and this was still COVID era, so it was a virtual interview, which is very difficult if you're a personable person totally different uh, and it and it's you got to go my name is kevin i do this you know like and it's dry and i'm like what why don't we lead off with a value statement what who you are and how you're going to bring them value and and we were the underdog by a landslide but 
the person that I think was supposed to get the job that was comfortable, probably feed up, relaxed, thought they had it. They got out beat by some hustlers that by the end of that interview, they thought we were already part of the project. That's, that's the feedback loop that I got at the end. Like, Hey, why did we win this? I just, I just want that wow. for the team. And uh, so, yes, I subscribe to what you said, John, like a relationship will might get you in the door and get you in that conference room or that virtual meeting, but don't take it for granted. That person might've put their neck out for you. So you should, you should be honored that relationship by showing up super prepared. So then they can look around and say, told you so. You can, I agree. You can never criticize over preparation. You can criticize over preparation if it manifests itself in somebody just grinding and going down rabbit holes that are irrelevant to the meeting, but I'd rather be over prepared. And typically if you're in an interview like that, you've only got so much time, you know, you might be 10 times more, like you might cover a 10th of what you have prepared, but you got to hit those high points. Quick, quick segue before we come back to, on this yeah. subject. Um, I was at a SMPS marketing boot camp years ago and a guy who's just a legend at the time, his name is Tom Sargent with PSMJ. He was like a VP of marketing. Every company had worked for had grown 10X, 20X, 100X. He said they were in Hawaii one time for a big uh, proposal presentation. And, you know, they arrived from the Southeast and they've all got on suits and ties. And he said, he's walking around and he's realizing the day he gets there, guys, this isn't going to work. We, we stand out like a sore thumb. Let's go get some clothes. They go to the men's shop. They get uh, tr more tropical stuff. They buy seersucker jackets. They come in with polo shirts and seersucker jackets, tackies. And he said that they won the job. They fit right in with everybody. Had they dressed the other way, it would have just said, you're you're not one of us. You're not from here. Now, you could say, well, that's a little manipulative. But no, he recognized the value. He recognized the culture. And he was willing to show that he was flexible. I mean, there's all these other things. Yes. It's about, it was about them, not about him. And that they still had a team that was prepared to deliver to that. And again, talk about being overprepared, recognizing you need to buy the guys a new wardrobe that you're with. We could do a whole podcast on the power of being self-aware in the moment rather than having to learn from hindsight. How many times do we have to learn looking back in hindsight, which a good leader might have done, right? A great leader is self-aware in that moment and is like, hey, I can see how this is going to play out. Let's adjust now before we go in there. Because why would you want to learn in hindsight if you have the opportunity to change the outcome in the moment? Very profoundly said, very well stated. And we could do an entire podcast on the the exercise and reflection involved in building emotional awareness and mental muscle so you can recognize and turn those triggers on and off because it is a definite skill just like lifting weights or or doing cardio right that's right i like your statement though why learn in hindsight if you can learn in the moment that's really good as my wife and some of my colleagues would attest to <laughs> this dude has learned a lot in hindsight Ah, uh, so, same. I am not on this high horse. Trust me. I am riddled in failure. Riddled. No, it's good. I, a friend of mine who's advised me on a lot of things, he said, you know, invent new mistakes. Like, do the same wrong thing two or three times and then invent a new mistake. If you keep making the same mistake, then it's time to move on, you know? Amen to that, man. Well said. So thanks for that. Um, so you were you were with AGT. You said you learned a ton there. You were in the glass and glazing industry. You worked at the business development. Then you went to Dynamic Glass, um, and you started something for Dynamic Glass, right? Yeah. So the, uh, they were based out of Houston, and they were looking for somebody to help start the DFW division and uh, help with strategic leadership. Hmm. And by this time in my life, this is. Um, you know, I guess mid year 2016. So I'm, I, I've been in Texas for six years and I'm, I'm seeing those people I've met through Texo and, and just in the construction community at large. And I'm starting to see how they're acting. And uh, there's some fake it till you make it that I think is healthy and unhealthy. And some of the healthy ways is like, 
I want to stop being selfish. I'm going to be selfless and I'm going to try it on, even though it's uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden it becomes more natural. Mm. And so all these things are happening. And so by then I start getting this vision of like, I, I want to be a different type of company. Like, yes, gl- it's glass and it's what I know best, but how are we going to change the industry through this? And wow. so when I went into that interview, I was on fire for that. And then, and I laid out exactly what I wanted to achieve from a purpose standpoint, and it has to be about people. And so it started 2016 is really when I started turning that light switch on that. It's not about me. And our industry is desperately craving, uh, f- to feel valued. Right. And, and, and our trades people that have kind of been beat down for generations to know that they're loved and know that without them, we're nothing. And, and so, um, we got to treat them like their family and everything because they are. And, and so those were some of the core foundations of what we started building that office from. And over the years, you, you could see the impact from it. Um, you know, when you, we, we'd start hiring glazers and iron workers and, and metal panel guys and gals in, in the field. And when you started doing nice things for them, they didn't believe it. They're like, eh, mm-mm. So the rug will be, that's right. Right. He needs something. Yeah, and you what do they you want? Just, you just show up to the shop, and all of a sudden, you see office people getting out, hugging, pull, pulling. Like I used to try to reverse the principal's office rules. So, like, hey, come to my office, man. I'd shut the door. It was just to praise them, and they're like, "What? What is this about?" And it's like, yeah, I, "What do you I, want?" <laughs> yeah, well, I think I'm getting fired, or it's just because it's programmed through the industry. Yeah, and and so like, there's been a ton of bittersweet moments le- leaning into this purpose of, of building up our people in a way to build up our industry that it's like, man, how dare our industry. But at the same time, this is what's needed. And we got to, if we get, we need more companies doing this to attract, you know, the bigger th- challenge to attract more people to this industry. Like, Hey, we're not going to throw our hard hat at you. We're not going to scream and swear and lay you off around the corner. After you do something for me, we're in this fight together. I value you. I value your family. Let's go do this together. And that is a journey that as you made the statement bittersweet. How does it feel? How does it feel to feel like a salmon swimming upstream? You're you're going against the tension of some culture, but you're building a great culture simultaneously within your within your group, your company. Did you feel like there wasn't as much friction as you thought? Like it wasn't really well embraced? Um, not, it it wasn't completely embraced. No, but we would convert people, right? Like Mm. I, I, if I, you know, like looking back things I could have done better, like through the hiring process, like if this isn't something that you're on fire for, or like you feel it true in your heart, you're not going to fit here Mm -hmm. because this is, this is the drum that we're going to beat every single day Mm -hmm. and and decisions are going to be made from it. Um, that, that salmon swimming up river. I'll share just like one of those moments where we decided to do something simple, just an employee of the month program for the shop in the field. So once a month, you're going to get a plaque, a gift card, and it it used to be going out to lunch with me. And the the first job site I showed up to, to give our first field guy employee of the month, I had the plaque and gift card. He was on a basket. I showed up on the slab and uh, I I waved him over. And again, he's scared. Why is El Jefe here? You know, am I about to get fired? Yeah. And so I just put my, we took our gloves off. I put, I put my hand out there and I'm like, Hey man, I'm just really proud of you. You're, you're, you're one of our core guys. You have a positive attitude. You're always there for your people. Uh, just want to let you know, you want our first employee of the month uh, that we're giving out to the field tears, his knees buckled. And uh, the bittersweet moment is he goes, boss, man, I've been in this 20 years and this is the first time I've ever received a compliment from the office. And I'm like, wow. Oh, we got to do so much. 20 better. years, 20 years. Like, could you imagine John going through 20 straight years without an attaboy? Wow. That's a guy driven by the right principles that he stuck with it and stayed at it without anybody's affirmation. But I'll bet that affirmation spoke volumes. What a great story that is, but you're right. It is Hopefully that's a lesson and a, and a great example to others listening that have maybe been convicted about that or affirming that they're already doing that and they need to do it better or maybe that they should start because 
Yeah, we've got to break down the barriers, not only within office, between genders and everything else and in and, and racial stuff, but we've got to break down barriers between well, white collar, blue collar, which is a really stupid thing to say anyway. It's just all people with different levels of skills, right? We've got to break down the barriers, though, particularly the, between office and field, and like those guys versus us guys, you know, like it shouldn't be. We all need each other. We all need each other. We're all human beings. We're all going through struggles, big and small. Yeah. And like, and it doesn't have to be grand. Like it, forget a plaque, you know, gift cards, you can't afford them. Like if, if, if you're limited with financial resources, put your arm around somebody, yeah. look them in the eye and smile, say so-and-so I'm proud of you. Oh, wow. Like you, you just keep showing up and you keep helping people. You keep helping this company that costs nothing. It costs nothing but a few seconds of time. And you, you think about the impact of that, like, and we'll get to, you know, legacy and, and what you want to be remembered by later. But like, I picture myself a fly in the wall of my people's uh, dinner table at their house. And I want it. I want them to be celebrating who they are, not who I am, but like, yeah. I am this person. I'm excited and I'm excited to be a part of this company and this mission. And I want to help other people. Like that's what I want to hear when I'm a fly in the wall and and I want to create as many of those moments as possible. And I, I'll tell you this, it doesn't, it doesn't just stop in, in the industry though, the, that barista at Starbucks needed the parking lot attendant, you know, those things pointing back to my dad that I got to watch back him. To your dad, yeah, I, Man, I, I chop it up with those people all the time and I thank them and, you know, a recent snowstorm, they, they're working and they, they need to be there for their job. But I'm like, hey, I appreciate you being here because without you being here, I wouldn't be able to get groceries for my family. You, you know, know what? I, I don't do this enough, but while we're on this <clears throat> trail, um, I, I do it. I do it some, you know, people at the grocery store checkout line, they have a nameplate. And if you call them by their first name, you say, thank, thank you, Bob. Thank you, Doris, or whatever. They look at you like, what? Because they're just scanning stuff. The other thing I do, <clears throat> if I see a trainee, and there's always somebody with them, if I see a trainee at the grocery store or some checkout line, I always go to the trainee line for two reasons. Number one, nobody cares more about that job and my products than that trainee because they got okay. something to prove. And secondly, they're just looking for affirmation. And I don't want them to feel rushed or like they have to apologize. Try that sometime. It's a good thing to do. Go to the trainee and just say, hey, you're doing a great job, man. Like, how long you been doing this? Oh, cool. Keep up the good work. Call them by the first name. It'll make their day. Yeah, I love that. And if they're not doing a great job, I think your life goes on, right? Like if your coffee at Starbucks is screwed up, so what? Yeah. Is that is it that big of a deal? But no, I will admit if, you know, if my wife and I need something, um, you know, full disclosure, uh, and I got to get through the grocery store quick. I always look for the 10 item or less line, the self-scan line, or the line with the guys in it, because the guys all have the same agenda. Get me through this with my debit card as quickly as I can. I'm out of here. Yeah. They're not rocking checkbooks anymore. <laughs> no, I want to get in and get out. Like that's, that's fun. So you, uh, one more question about that last experience you obviously had passion and energy and, and clear purpose. Did you have a written set of core values or core purpose in the company like that people knew they had to adhere to or that they had to manifest? Ah, oh, this is why you do podcasts, John. You're a great interviewer. That's another great question. It all started with a vision statement and it was to create a people first culture where the team loves what they do and executes at the highest level. Okay. The core values were people, passion, and execution pulled from that same sentence. I didn't want to overcomplicate it and make it too hard to understand. And, and it was, it was, we gave at the end of the year, you give out core value awards, three of them, people award, passion award, execution. And, and the vision was everything. It's broadcasted everywhere. Um, in order for it to stick, we would have weekly strategy meetings and uh, somebody would bring something up about a job or a project pursuit. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. What's our core values? <laughs> and, and they'd be like, oh, you know, like, and I just wanted to, and it wasn't to like put people on the spot, but it, I wanted to make sure everybody knew, like, regardless of everything else going on, this is what we stand for. Um, 
So we had a vision statement and three core values. That was it. Yeah, I like that, Kevin, because, you know, what, what I've learned, um, uh, two things, core values aren't aspirational. Core values are the things we actually do and show and exhibit. They're, they're not something we're working towards. They're something we are. The second thing is if you've got more than five, it's too complicated. You got to have three, four, five, maybe, you know, we, we went through a, a team led exercise to, to pick core values. You know, we had like 20 things on the list. I know Tom Cornelier went through this too, if he's listening at TSI, um, you know, he said some of the hardest work he's ever done. I know it's some of the hardest work I've ever done. Um, how in the world do we collectively come up with a set of core values? But you know, there's a process to do it. EOS that we're running now, it certainly helps the entrepreneurial operating system. Yeah. And, you know, the cream rises to the top and three of the five were ones that I initiated and our implementers like, well, that's normal because he's the co he's the founder, co-founder, creator of the company. So you would think they would come from that, but a couple of them made it in there that I wouldn't have thought of. And, um, you know, ours are uh, communication, integrity, collaboration, client conscious and capable. And, and in that order too, like they were voted in that order. And so we, we now, when we just started this last year, when we do annual reviews, you're scored plus, plus, minus, or minus on the five core values. That's the, that's the subjective analysis. Then, yeah, there's billable scorecards and utilization scorecards and all that stuff, but it's really cool. And to your other point about core values, I think they're better story told. So like if somebody exhibits core value in, an, in a communication with a client, one of us will jump in and go, this is an example of communication. This is an example of client conscious or, you know, whatever that is. And, and we'll even list those like in an all staff meeting. So we're still learning and growing in that, but I, I just find tremendous ongoing, improving clarity from having the same set of core values. Like you said, if you, if you come work here at whatever place, this is what you sign up for. If you're not this, you're not going to want to be here. That's right. Like, and that's another thing. Like, Any time in the future, I, if you have a vision statement that you're bleeding it and values that you're bleeding it, like I, I want the interviewee to know, hey, this is our identity. Like, like ideal team player. Think of Patrick Lencioni, the humble, hungry, smart. Right. Yeah. Like I, if you aren't these things, this is not going to be a good job for you, and I don't want that for you. So like, I know you're trying to put on your best face in this interview, but really reflect on this when you go home and like, am I that person or do I want to become that person? Because if you don't, let's save each other the time. And yeah. Too often in that courting process, like I know John, he's a, he's an absolute killer when it comes to glazing, but he doesn't believe two of our three core values, but he's, I, I know he's really good at his job. You know, it's like, how often does that work out when you don't fit the, the culture and, and direction the company's trying to go you know like do each it, it takes discipline on both ends don't just hire because i mean the talent war book mike sorelli don't hire for character train for skill you know like you gotta find the right fits in your in your organizations it will never work if you're misaligned with the core values now it doesn't mean you have to be plus 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 you can be plus 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 minus or plus minus plus and hey we all have to be coachable and teachable, right? Like we're all works in progress. But if, yeah, if, if you like, you got one out of three, but you don't really buy into the other two or whatever, it will never work. It'll work for 18 months or 30 months or whatever, but somebody's going to get frustrated or irritated or angry or upset. And it, like you say, you, you move on. So, man, that's a great conversation. Thank you for that. Um, yep. Obviously, a lot of great things happened there. I want to ask, though, I want to mention, I, I see on your, you are, are you chairman of the board for Texo right now? I am. So this is, this is the year where I'm chairman and um, I, I've served just about in any branch of Texo you can think of from AIA to Young Constructors Council to the foundation about recruiting and re retaining, educating the next generation just all of it. And I have been so abundantly blessed about this industry. 
that when they asked me to become a board member five or six years ago, it were it was already about yeah, I, I want to give back. Like it has nothing to do with me and putting the spotlight or anything like that. And so over over those year those few years, th- then they asked like, hey, we'd like to set you up for a chairmanship. And I mean, by now, like I, Texo's giving me everything. How could I huh. not do it? And uh, and I think it makes it just more genuine because this year, I, this isn't the year of Kevin Carey when it comes to Texo. It's I'm here to serve whatever's best for this association, its members, and the industry. That's that's the direction we're going to go. And I'm I'm not the most well polished person, or I don't have 40 years in the industry, but I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to give you my passion. I'm going to bring energy to the room and try to inspire people. So it's going to be a fun year. We just got, came off our strategic uh, retreat a few weeks ago, and, uh, and, and that group uses EOS. And so I'm familiar really? with that. And, and it brings a board. If you could picture 34 people that are like us trying to steer a boat in the same direction, <laughs> it's wild. This has brought structure to it. So like if it goes from John's chairmanship last year to mine this year, we don't do a 180 based on leadership styles. It's like, no, no, let's yep. keep building on these rocks yep. and milestones and yep. goals from last year and just keep building on them next year. And it keeps us organized and structured. And uh, it, it, it really has built momentum within the association. That's fantastic. So this is a, I'm assuming this is a not-for-profit, you know, um, agency that people pay a f- membership fee for and you're using EOS. So you've got, they're doing quarterly rocks and annual planning and they've got a vision traction organizer and all those things. Yep. Just for the board. And then there's so many offerings that sure. Texo gives its member companies. It's, it's unbelievable. Well, that's one of the, I won't get off on a full rant on EOS, but just one of the things that, I, and we've only been doing it for about 20 months, but one of the things I love about EOS is anybody in the company can step in and facilitate any meeting because every meeting follows the same structure. Segway, scorecard, to-dos, client employee update, IDS, review to-dos, score the meeting, move on, get things done, get traction, talk about the right things. I I love that part. Um, So that's really cool that you've got a group like Texo. Well, Shout out to you. I mean, you sound like a person who has grown tremendously to go from the south side of Chicago, um, kind of, yeah, I'll do college for mom, to being yeah. chairman of the board. Hey, I'm proud of you too, man. That's that's a great achievement. That's, that's a great story. Um, and for them to embrace you as well says a lot about them. You know, you weren't a lifetime Texan, so you're coming into this organization and yeah, it's just, that's a great story. So congratulations. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's an absolute honor. Sounds like it. I wish I was a member. That sounds really cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. Tell us a little bit, though, now you are now the chief mountain mover um, for your mountain mover group. Tell us about that. What is it? Yeah, so September of last year, um, I made that, I made a transition and a few years ago I, I started a podcaster and he just taken a couple steps back and we started this podcast called 1720 coming from Matthew 1720, have faith to move mountains. And I thought maybe my mom and my co-host Stuart, his, his mom would listen and we had no idea what we were doing. And, but we just set out a, a, as a purpose to impact our industry and go positively impact lives that that's what we wanted to do. And, um, we, we recorded every single week and uh, it started building traction to your, your, your EOS word in the <laughs> industry. And, and yeah. we were just bringing our good buddies on to tell their stories. And we just yeah. story after story, first person or it's their, their, the CEO's first time ever sharing their story. And it's just phenomenal how natural they were on the microphone and, and the stories got out there and it's, it, it just, it just started getting big and, it really started solidifying my purpose in life, right? Um, where the if 1720 and my faith are the nucleus of it, I want to go build an army of mountain movers one person at a time. And, and that's po- that I could boil that down to positively impacting people. And whatever the vehicles are to do that, I'm in. So glazing was a vehicle to go achieve that. The podcast was a, a vehicle to achieve that. 
but now I have this mountain movers company that, that, that is, that is the vision, the, the values, everything. It all boils down to building an army of mountain movers. And so the mountain mover army, what I'm doing right now is executive coaching in the construction space. I'm doing workshops. So we did four or five strategic corporate retreats, uh, in January. Um, and those are, uh, I, I could go on for days about the excitement from those. And, um, I, I started writing a book in October and the first draft was completed about a month ago. So that's off to editing and publishing. And it's, mm. it's just, a, it's allowed me to just fully lean into who I am and why I'm here and what I'm supposed to do. And I'm just having an absolute blast doing it. Wow. Very exciting. Um, <clears throat> So you want to impact, you say you want to impact lives, positively impact lives, one person, one company at a time. Yes. Yeah. And there, the opportunity is great. Um, you know, some of these group workshops, you get, you get a mixed bag of people that are excited to be there. Um, you know, like you go offsite. I'm a big believer for in January to go on an offsite retreat. You get away from the hustle and bustle and you bring everybody together and uh, I'm always a proponent. I, I, yes, we're going to work on the company, but let's work on the person too. Because if the person is healthy, they'll, they'll create a healthier company. It's a byproduct. And so you work on personal goals. You work on professional goals. You work on where do we want to go this year? Who are we as a company? All these different things. But then the, all the ancillary items like cooking together and activities and, and hanging out by the fire, like all that sort of stuff matters. And, and to the mixed bag comments, there's, there's going to be people that are excited to be there. And then you're going to have the, the scowl arms crossed guy or gal staring at you as well. <laughs> and I address that right from the beginning. And it's, Hey, whether you want to be here or not, or whether you think this is going to add value or not, you're right. So you're here, you made it relax. Let's, let's just be open. Let's, let's figure this out. Let's see, let's see what we could get out of it. Because I promise you, if you, you're open to it, this will positively impact your life and your company. And when you kind of set that tone, also opening up with vulnerability um, of sharing some like tough spots of my life and also relatability that there's not a position in those seats that I probably haven't been in other than accounting. I've I've sat in those seats. I have those stripes. So I'm not just this guy coming off the, off the street, not knowing construction. And um, it, I, I, I think, retreats are just absolutely magical because it can set the tone for your rest of your year. The challenge is just like with new year's resolutions in the beginning of January, you get everybody on fire in January. What happens in February, March, April, the rest of the year, like somebody's yeah. got to be there to continue that on Yeah, because the fire will, will burn out. Your feelings will burn out. You yeah. got to allow consistency and habits to fill that gap. And so that's what I'm there for to try and keep it going and keep inspiring people throughout the year. And a big way to try and inspire people throughout the year is walk the talk. So I, I hold myself to a very high level and standard when it comes to goals and, um, and purpose and, and, and the tribes I'm rolling with and all that sort of stuff. So, um, it, it, it's, it's been pretty fun and it's cool to see the impact it's making in the industry. And I'm just having a blast doing it. That's great. Do you have um, other mile markers or backstops or check-ins that are set up post retreat to help, you know, just like with EOS, you know, like you report on your rocks quarterly, your to-dos are deadlined by a certain date. Like, do you have ways to help? Because the tyranny of the urgent takes over for all of us at some point, you know, we got to pull weeds. We got to, we got to hoe ground. Like we got to do all that stuff. Do you have, do you have methods of check-ins to help them stay on the path or not? Absolutely. So it's hard for me to do that if I'm kind of one and done with your company. So I have a sidebar with whoever hires me. It's like, you have, if you want this to take ground, you have to continue on with it or empower others within your group to do so. So I did these retreats when I was, when I was running teams and and businesses as well. And so when, when I, when I was part of it, we never stop. So if you you gave me your goals, it was literally pinned in the hallway with a goal board. And I wanted personal, professional. You know, like I think the buckets that are important with goal achieving are your personal, your your spiritual, your your family, 
your work. And, um, and I want all of them. They're all equally important to me, but people that have been around me for a while, they're, they're, they're very cautious to put what they want up there because they know from January to December, I'm coming. I'm I'm going to check in with you because I want you to win. I don't want you to do this for me. Yeah. I want you, I want you to win. So, and I'll get into that in a minute, but pinning those on the wall and coming up with a theme and a goal board was really powerful. And then a big nautical bell that you could ring, not for sales, but for goals. When somebody achieves their goals, it's inclusive. Um, that helped. And once a month, you knew it was coming. The first Monday of every month, we were meeting specifically on that. But here's your report out. Are you winning? You're losing? How can we help you? And it gets, real, it gets real old and tired if you've shown up for six straight months and said, I haven't made any movement on any of these goals. Because not yeah, only are you like, sorry, go ahead. No, please. Yeah, that's for sure. You're, you're, you're not only letting yourself down, but you're also kind of showing some character traits that are probably bleeding into your work life as well. Like what else are you leaving hanging out there? Um, if you don't even want to do the things that you want to get done. Um, so it, it really built people up, but the most rewarding thing, like I, I just got a text message the other day from a, a former colleague and they, they sent me a picture of their diploma and they're like, just want to let you know, man, I did it. And I was like, yes. Like, That's awesome. You're you're changing the game for your future generations of your family. And that and that's what matters because that person, if they're achieving things, like we'll, we'll we'll think about like in rocking chair moments. I don't want to sit in my rocking chair 30 years from now, whatever the case may be, and look back and said, Boy, I set lose 15 pounds for 30 straight years and I only achieved it three years. What yeah. I want to do is this year I'm gonna lose 15 pounds. And then rather than abandon that the following year, how am I going to build on that? What's next? All right, I'm going to start exercising. Let's, let's build some muscle. Then I achieve that. And then the year after that is, okay, now I'm going to start cutting my body fat through some you know rigorous diet. And then year after year, you're going to look back and you're going to far out punt any dreams that you've had that you could achieve because you stay disciplined in your goals year by year. And that's why I'm so passionate about it because that's just a fitness example, but you could put career, your family life, habits you want to break, habits you want to make, and they all can happen through that discipline program. Yeah, I always say, <clears throat> don't make a New Year's resolution, just resolve. In fact, if you're thinking of a New Year's resolution and it's November 13th, start on November 13th, just resolve. It has to be sustainable. You, What we do, it has to be sustainable if we can't keep at it initially, get somebody to help hold us accountable. Yes. We, ultimately, we can't hold people accountable if they don't want to be accountable. But if they want to be accountable, like, you know, the reason I hired an executive coach, personal coach for personal and, and professional, I just couldn't get I just couldn't get past some things. I couldn't get through some things. I I couldn't make certain changes. I mean, for the first year, he was like, yeah, I was kind of worried. I was not sure how this was going to go. And now I, I almost like at times that like, you know, I'll be, I joke, I'll, I'll be on this path until I take my last breath, you know, but like now it's almost like, oh my gosh, it's like an out of body experience. I see the pattern. I see the signal. Do, do I sidestep it or do I, do I, yeah, I fail all the time, but you, you got to have somebody to walk that path with you, somebody to introduce principles and practices to you that you're not stuck doing the same thing all the time. Yeah. I just don't want people to regret it. And, and you, you perfectly looped it back to being self-aware in the moment too. Like vulnerability is such a powerful tool. And I like the times that I've failed repeatedly, I, it, it's self-sabotage. I, I wanted to fail. I wanted that past to come back and bite me again. I missed it, you know, but if I share it with you and you're in my peer group and I'm like, you know what, that past is creeping up on me again. Could you pray for it? Or can you hold me accountable? Yeah. I'm not going to let my friend down. I don't want to let him down. And it, and it really helps me become better. And, and, and my inner circle people, they know I'm crazy. So like I, when I, <laughs> When, when October comes around, I start sending them goals. They're like, oh boy, he's texting us because there's no turning back now. Uh, Is, would you just, I'm glad you're crazy. Um, so as far as you know now, in this moment, being present now, is this your life work now? 
mountain movers like uh, like purpose like my purpose in life like in terms of like professionally and personally you you've started mountain movers coaching speaking helping people like i'm not thinking like what you'll think 30 years from now but this is your direction now is this this is your path now this is your passion now is that correct oh, oh it is my life's mission absolutely everything revolves around how do i impact people and uh how do i give the glory to god you know i'll, I'll talk about a totem pole for a second last year was the first year after after figuring a lot of things out where i thought my totem pole was actually standing on its feet for the first time and so like Standing upright, it's my priorities should be God, family, and work. And forever that was flipped upside down. Forever. Yeah. And what I figured out about that is not it's not that God is everything and nothing else matters. It's an order of operations for me. If I put God first, I'm gonna be a better husband and I'm gonna be a better father. And if I put those two first, I'm gonna show up to work as a better leader. And I'm living in that right now, and I could see the fruits from that. I could see how people around me are being benefited from it. And so when I focus on building an army of mountain movers one person at a time, that starts here in this house with this family and building Quinn up, my daughter. she She's five, and she's sponging things together, and I want to set the example of what's important. Uh, I want her in church every week. Because I want when I fail her and her mom fails her, she has somewhere to go that won't fail her. Um, you know, like all all that's super important. And and anything else that gets added to my life, future companies, and, and those are all just vehicles to the purpose. And I don't profit, that's a byproduct. Um, size, mm -hmm. byproduct. The projects we work on, byproduct. It's about mm -hmm. the relationships we build, the lives we build. We impact in our communities, in our businesses, our business, our colleagues, families, like all of that. That that is a common denominator. No matter what business I'm in, no matter what what house I'm standing in, like that's it. Yeah, uh, it it means everything to me. That's awesome. I I have a couple other questions on your professional stuff, um, but I just uh, before I go there, for the sake of the audience, some of whom may not know. Um, we didn't, we didn't script any of this out, but I just wanted to, to speak to this. Um, when Kevin talks about Matthew 17, 20, he's referring to a new Testament book in the Bible, the book of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector in the Jewish community, which was one of the most despised people, um, in the Jewish community because they were considered betrayers collecting taxes. If you've watched the movie, the chosen or the series, the chosen, that that have a really good actor portraying what they think Matthew is like. He's very this didactic, almost like Asby guy, but he's recording everything. He's recording stuff as he goes along. So he basically is trying to record the things Jesus did and said. And when you talk about mountain movers, when he says Matthew 17, 20, Jesus was saying, because you have so little faith, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And you might go, well, wait a minute. I can't tell Mount Rainier or this hill or this dirt pile to move. Wait, you really can, but I, I look at that as multiple things. The mountain of alcoholism, the mountain of workaholism, the mountain of drug addiction, the mountain of pornographic addiction, the mountain of 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 self, you know, self promotion, the mountain, the mountain, the mountain, the mountain of this or that, and in Christ, at least from my and your faith background, in Christ, nothing is impossible. That you can you can tell and command that you know what. Be gone, be be rid. I cast you aside, and we certainly need a community to help us do that. But that is what is being referred to when we're talking about the mountain mover in Matthew seventeen twenty. Um, in fact, I, I love one pastor I was listening to recently said like when Luke and Matthew and they were writing, they weren't quote writing the Bible. They weren't doing like the Bible. They were writing on a scroll. They had no idea this would be captured and retained through antiquity 
and become canonized for everybody to read, you know? So anyway, that's, that's my, that's my rant. I refuse to even comment on it because that was so perfectly said. Oh, my goodness, you. Bishop Wheaton in the house. <laughs> I am only a benefactor from all who have gone before me and all of the things I absorb and listen to and read. So thank you for that. Amen. Kevin, um, you have a, can you speak to a couple, you have a couple of other involvements. Is there anything significant or meaningful about those? Like, are you doing boards? Are you doing like advisory committees? Are you doing things to help like advise companies in other ways? Yeah, there's so um, purpose driven companies like it, to the earlier point, no matter, no matter what I'm doing, it needs to be cent centered in that. And the one I'll highlight is Katie striping. Um, so that, that's one where uh, it got started uh, through a former guest of the podcast. He was new to the industry. He was, his name's Dan Bradley. He was an air force commander, a flight commander for their special warfare group. Just wow. an amazing, amazing story and warrior and patriot. And, uh, he, he, I got introduced to him through Mike Sorelli and a couple other, uh, former guys in the, in the, uh, industry. They're like, Hey, this dude's new to the DFW and construction. Can you meet him? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, so I, I gave him the one one like join Texo, like this, go meet these people. I'm going to tee you up with all these great people. And him and I became friends and the company he was with, it was one of those like that don't represent us that well type companies. And he was about, to, we were about to lose a gem of a leader and we mm -hmm. had a lunch conversation. It's like, man, I, I'm telling you, we need people like you in this industry. Let's go figure something out. And so mm -hmm. he started, he started a parking lot striping and maintenance company stripes wow. on the ground, right? Like, and that's not your identity. That's, that's the vehicle to your purpose through yeah. those lines of pain on the ground. We're going to go positively impact lives and he's doing it already. Um, and, it, and it's just, oh, it's, it's so awesome to watch him thrive and stay in our industry and help support him as much as possible. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Um, as we're getting, I always think what, what my, my production group, BVS Productions are probably thinking, will he ever stick to an hour? I don't believe it. Like, <laughs> so thanks Dan and your team for you know, my scope creep is always, I'm, I'm like, you, you, in fact, you know what it means when the, like I set, I set my clock on here. I was thinking that story when the preacher takes his watch off, you know what it means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It. it means it's going to be a long one. That's right. Someday I'm going to go full Tim Ferriss and I was like, Oh, we've been on for two and a half hours. Okay. Time to wrap up. See you later. You That's know. right. Um, Kevin, uh, you've been a wealth of information and positivity. I, I could talk all day. Um, any, uh, as we're kind of closing um, on the personal side, you've shared a lot actually about who you are, but any, like, what are you doing now? Anything you do for hobbies or recreation, any books you're reading, routines or mindsets, anything that you'd like to share you think we might benefit from? Oh, boy. Yeah. All right. Let me try to get this quickly as possible. So family, like reversing my totem pole, family is, is huge and, and getting to spend more time with my family has been an absolute blessing in this season. So doing things with them is one of my favorite things to do when I get selfish. It's, it's the morning routine. So I wake up typically between four and four twenty, and I, I go to work out before anybody else is up. So it's my selfish time to thrive and um, it, whether you're a morning person or not, but you can become one. You just got to keep doing it and re-identify yourself because I was the furthest from that until I started putting those reps in, but I love working out. I love what it does for my mentality and, and, uh, my spirituality and how it makes me show up as a better leader throughout the day. Um, so I love that. And I'm a huge consumer of books, huge consumer. I'm a nonfiction guy. These like these are signed ones above my head there that I've, wow. I've received from leaders that I love and I listen to them when I commute and I just I because I'm just in this pursuit to become a better person. Um, I want to look back five years from now, every five years, and be like, oh, man, you look like you're standing still. And there's so wow. many incredible warriors. Like I I never want to be leading the pack. I always want to I want to be helping others, but I always want to find people that could be mentors to me and, and make me feel like I'm standing still because I'm that pursuit of knowledge is endless. Um, and then obviously serving in church. I, uh, 
I, I'm, I'm serving actually tonight. So Wednesday nights I do youth ministry. So, uh, I'm assigned eighth graders and, uh, it's an absolute blast. And, uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing most of the time, but I'm sure trying and connecting with these kiddos and I love the kiddos and, uh, that's great. Those are things I love. What a pivotal age that is too. It's really good. I, I love that you are getting up between four and four twenty. That's impressive. Uh, guy that helps coach us on EOS. He's, he said he's been, he decided to get up earlier this year and I've always been an early riser, but you know, I wasn't, I mean, I was talking six fifteen or six thirty, but uh, I'm telling you getting up a little earlier, an hour earlier, whatever, it is a cheat code. I mean, I, I'm like you, I got it. I got to get up for everybody else and work out and keep my AD, ADD brain like in line and, hydrate properly and all these things. But um, yeah, that's really good. I think that you should start doing, like you're going to beat out Jocko Willink. I think you should start posting pictures of your watch at 4.05 and be yeah, like, yeah. go get after it, dudes. You know? So so my version of that, I have this daily motivation email that goes out every single weekday and the and the tribe of, of followers know when I woke up because it goes out you know, a little bit after I've gotten a few things done in the morning. Yeah. And then so like, like today's, for example, it went out at a uh, five 30. And so people okay. are like, Whoa, what's happening? You sleeping in today? And, <laughs> you know, that, it holds me accountable. Every person that gets added to that daily motivation list is increased accountability to go find a nugget for them. But it's one of the first things I do in the morning. Um, just like there, there's that opportunity when you wake up that early to just set your day and your discipline and build some habits up. I always recommend to do 10 things before you touch your phone. So go buy a, a cheapo alarm clock and put it on your nightstand, plug your phone in the kitchen and, and don't touch your phone until you've done a few things. You've prayed, you've, you've, you've taken a vitamin, you, you've uh, anything, made your cup of coffee, whatever it is that you love, just whatever go your routine things. is. Yes. And, and I promise you, you're going to fall in love with it over time and, and, and benefit from it. That's really good. Well, if he stayed on to listen long enough, I'll just call out Matt Verderamo. I mean, you guys are killing me with the, how early you get. Matt gets up at 445, I think. Maybe it's 415. I can't remember. He's probably like rolling his eyes if he's listening. But <laughs> you're, you're, you're beating us all, man. But I, I do have a friend of mine, Ralph Gaddy. I've known him for years. And I think he's always gotten up at 345 or 4. I mean, forever in it's a cheat code. I mean, it's amazing what you get done. So that's good. We're, we are up against time out of respect for your time and, and everybody listening, we're going to have to wrap up any final words before we close. Yeah. Just rocking chair moments. So whatever age you are, wherever you're at in life, you know, find a purpose that when you're, when you're retired and reflecting back on your life, it was about something bigger than yourself. It was about something bigger than that bottom line, something that where you're impacting lives and you're impacting the people around you and stuff that'll make you smile when you're looking back at your life. Just go, tr go out there, try to create some rocking chair moments for people each and every day. Thank you, Kevin. That's really good. Begin with the end in mind as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that you've done it again. You've invested a little more than an hour of your life in the Creating Structure podcast. I'm super grateful that you've done that. I've learned a lot from Kevin. He's Kevin Carey. He is Chief Mountain Mover at Mountain Movers. He is the founder and co-host of 1720 Podcast, board member, various places, um, and a guy who came up through the ranks in the glass and glazing industry and contracting industry. Kevin, I can't thank you enough for being on. I've enjoyed this greatly. I hope to see you in person sometime in the near future. Oh, 100%, John. I appreciate you having me. Okay, thanks, everybody. We're signing off now. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.